Please open your Bibles to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58. Our lesson tonight will be taken from this passage. If you haven't seen the bulletin, my sermon this evening is entitled Beyond Fasting. Beyond Fasting. And it's a, an unusual sermon, uh, unusual sermon title. First of all, because it will be followed by a chili cook-off. That's, <laughs> that's a coincidence. <laughs> it is an unusual title because when, uh, when Christians discuss spiritual maturity and growth in Christ, fasting is one of those activities that we think belong in the, you know, the upper reaches of our, of our Christian experience. I mean, you know, we think only truly dedicated and spiritually mature people fast. I mean, what, what then could be beyond fasting? I mean, what, what, what are you supposed to do beyond fasting? When you read the Bible and you focus in on the subject of fasting, you see that it is helpful in sharpening one's focus when praying or seeking God's will. For example, in Acts chapter 13, verse one, we see the leaders of the church, the elders of the church, teachers of the church are fasting and they're praying before selecting Saul and Barnabas to go on a missionary journey. But aside from this, we do not see fasting in itself as a spiritual exercise that builds up the church or is especially pleasing to God as a constant practice. Isaiah the prophet explains that there are things that can be done that are far more pleasing than fasting and certainly more edifying for the church. And so in the 58th chapter of his book, Isaiah describes three things better than fasting, three activities that go beyond fasting in their ability to please God. So let's begin reading in Isaiah 58. Isaiah writes, cry loudly, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways. As a nation that has done righteousness and has not forsaken the ordinance of their God, they ask me for decisions, for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose? A day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? And so in these few verses, Isaiah rebukes his fellow Israelites for their hypocrisy and their constant complaining. They love to be known as the people of God. They delight in thinking that they know God's ways and they have divine guidance. Even though these things have been true in the past, in recent times their nation has stumbled. They find themselves in political and military trouble during the day of Isaiah. So they make a show of their great religiosity with a fast and with public prayer, but their situation persists. There's no relief politically, there's no relief economically. Now, they begin questioning God and asking, why doesn't He respond to their prayers? Why has He not responded to their fasting? Which they think is the ultimate spiritual act of devotion. At this point, God does answer them through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. And He says to them that their fasting before Him is not acceptable because it is not accompanied by the things that He truly desires from them, with or without, a fast, three things that go beyond fasting. And so he wants them to go beyond fasting and first of all, minister his justice. Verse six, he says, is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, 
to undo the bands of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Denying yourself is a good exercise, but obtaining freedom and justice for those who are denied these things, this is better than fasting. Whether it be an effort to support and defend those who are oppressed by injustice in any form in our society, or freeing those enslaved by sin through the power of the gospel, this type of service is far superior to merely creating an artificial hardship for ourselves through fasting. Fasting may help one see God. Fasting may help one discern God's will with a little more clarity. But freeing the oppressed establishes God's justice for others and it allows them to see God working on their behalf through you, through a believer. God also wanted them to go beyond fasting and do something else. Minister His love, verse seven. Isaiah writes, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Denying ourselves food and drink for a time, this is not an act of love, it's an act of discipline. Of course, discipline is a good thing and necessary to cultivate in a Christian's life but it's not the way God wants us to show our love for Him. Fasting focuses the attention on self and it's all about mastering self. Love requires us to focus on others and showing our love to God demands that we focus our attention on others, not self. Isaiah mentions two examples of ministering God's love in verse, um, in verse seven. First, benevolence sharing food and clothing, so on and so forth. And secondly, taking the responsibility for the needs of one's own family. And so fasting provides a demonstration of one's self-control before God. It's a, it's a private thing. No one else is supposed to know. But ministering God's love, however, creates a triple witness that glorifies and honors God. It's a witness to God Himself that you love Him. It's a witness to others that you are a sincere Christian. And it's a witness to the world that God is love and God's disciples in Christ minister God's love to other people. One other spiritual exercise that Isaiah mentions, which goes far beyond fasting, ministering God's peace in verse 9b. It says, if you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. You know, the good feeling we get from fasting is that of self-satisfaction, the pleasure we experience when we begin mastering our own flesh. Now don't get me wrong, this is okay. This is a legitimate pleasure when we take control over our flesh. But our fasting doesn't create good feelings in other people. It has no power to do this. As a matter of fact, fasting at times causes jealousy and fear and hatred in others because it focuses on their weakness as opposed to our strength. You know, a good example of this is the, 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 the trend in Hollywood towards extreme thinness. And this trend simply demonstrates a power statement. You know, if, if, this, if this young actress is thinner than that young actress, that, that young actress has a power over that other one. It makes us feel powerful when we can demonstrate control over our flesh in front of people who seemingly cannot. This is why the Lord says that fasting, when it is done, should be done in secret and only between ourselves and God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Isaiah says, however, that when we create unity and peace among others by removing what burdens them and refraining from spreading wickedly, uh, sp uh, speaking rather wickedly and, 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 and critically, these actions combined with the other ministry deeds will provide light and joy to other people, a light and joy that personal fasting cannot produce. Ministering God's peace means that arguments and disputes and criticisms and divisions and other such things are on the decline when we are involved. You ever notice that if you're a supervisor, manager, or something like a teacher, 
and there's trouble, there always seems to be trouble over in, with this group over here. And eventually when you get to the root of the problem, there's usually one person in that group that you know, we call old fast troublemaker. Wherever they are, there's trouble. You switch them over here and you put them in that side of the classroom, now there's trouble on that side or with those people because some people invariably bring trouble. They gossip, they criticize, they, oh, you know, they, they, they just stir people up. Well, Isaiah, or God is saying through Isaiah, uh, when you're around, those type of things should not increase. increase. Those things should decrease. You bring peace to wherever you are. We bring healing. We lift up. We speak kindness and wisdom and love. And like salt or light, our presence fills the situation with what Paul the Apostle referred to as the aroma of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. In contrast to this, the Lord never demanded or blessed or spoke in positive terms about fasting because as a spiritual exercise, it was limited. It's a good thing, but it's a limited thing. Limited especially when compared to the results that ministering His justice, ministering His love, and ministering His peace could create. Now, I don't want you to you know, misinterpret what I'm, what I'm saying. This lesson is not a harangue about fasting. Fasting is a useful spiritual exercise for the individual Christian when accompanied with study and meditation and prayer. My point here is that whatever benefits that derive from fasting pale in comparison to the more mature spiritual activities described by Isaiah in this passage. Note the rewards he mentions that come forth from ministering God's justice, love, and peace. First of all, he mentions the powerful witness of faith. Verses six to eight, just read verse eight. He says, then you're, you do these things, right? The rewards of ministry. Then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily bring forth and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Isaiah says that whatever people thought of you before, uh, before you ministered will be replaced by the unmistakable light of a true and sincere witness of the Lord. In other words, people will know that a man or a woman of God has been among them because of the ministry that you render to others. In other words, still, there will be no doubt in anyone's mind, yours included, that you are a genuine child of God. Everything you do will be bathed in the light of God's glory you will look blessed from every direction, whether you're looking at your own life or whether others are looking at your life and feeding it back to you. You will be blessed, he says. Another reward of ministry, aside from a powerful witness of faith, is a powerful prayer life. Verse 9a, he says, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and He will say, here I am. You notice the parallelism, remember when we studied the Psalms, the parallelism, he's saying the same things in two different ways here. When you call, the Lord will answer. When you cry, he will say, here I am. You know, it is the prayers of the righteous that availeth much, James says in his epistle. The pra he didn't say the many prayers, he didn't say the repeated prayers, he didn't say the long prayers, he says the prayers of the righteous availeth much. The key word there is righteous. The keys to powerful prayer are faith and righteousness. Not just believing person praying, but a righteous believer praying. When you're lifting up your hands to God in prayer and you believe everything you say, take a look at your hands. Take a look at the works of your hands and see if they're clean. See if they're righteous hands that you can raise up to God. You know, when Paul says the men you know, in, the, in the church, in the public, the men should lift up holy hands in prayers. He's not just saying the male species, you know, not the males in the church, the men in the church should lift hands. He's also saying the men who have holy hands 
should lift them up in prayer. It's the holiness of the hands and the faith in one's hearts that render prayer effective, that gives power in prayer. When your prayers are not, when your prayers are not answered, don't look at your faith, look at your hands. When it comes to prayers being answered, it's more important that you are righteous than you are loud or repetitious or eloquent or fasting even. A final reward to those who seek to go beyond fasting is that God will bless you with a powerful ministry. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. God will reward you with a powerful ministry. He's not talking to professional ministers here. He's talking to everyone because everyone has a ministry of sorts. Isaiah, in context here, was speaking to his Jewish countrymen and he was exhorting them not to think that their outward religious exercises, like fasting, was what empowered them to do great things in God's name for His people. Power in ministry doesn't find its source in religious ceremony. Power in ministry comes from doing God's will in ministering to people. It doesn't matter if we have a cappella singing in our public worship if we don't love each other. We can sing without instruments all night long, but if we don't love each other, our worship is, is, not, is useless. The Jews were promised that they would be the people through whom the Christ would come and they could provide a powerful ministry to the world by preparing the world to be ready for this. Isaiah is telling them that they can get the world's attention by their ministering God's justice, by their ministering God's love and peace. Now, we know that they failed to listen to this warning. The Christ still came according to the promise, but was born to a nation whose reputation in the world was as religious hypocrites, cultural bigots, and political rebels. Jesus, therefore, was born into a nation a thousand years past its glory and a scant 70 years away from its final destruction. We should note carefully Isaiah's message because it still speaks powerfully and prophetically even to us today. You see, like the Jews of Isaiah's day, we in this age have been charged with the preparation of the world for the return of Christ. They were charged, they were the people of God and their job was to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. That was their task. We are also the people of God and we have been charged with the preparation of the world for the return of Christ. So let's be careful when we look at the Jews and say, well, those guys, you know, what was their problem? If I was there, I would have you know, done this. I, you know, I wouldn't have missed it. Well, let's be very careful. We've also been given a charge as serious as their charge. Of course, the return of Jesus, this time, however, not for the work of saving the world, but rather for the task of judging the world and using a reward or condemnation, or rather issuing a reward or condemnation to those who deserve either one. We, as God's people, as Christians, accomplish this task, this task of preparing the world. We accomplish this task by preaching the gospel and the witnessing of the power of our regenerated lives as we minister Christ's justice, as we minister His love, as we minister His peace. We're also preparing our fellow saints for His return through the power of our prayer life and our faith and our ministry. And these spiritual activities that go far beyond mere fasting are like the combustion chamber that moves the kingdom of God to that inexorable moment when Christ will appear. And He will appear. The thing we need to be absolutely convinced of is He will appear at a time that we do not expect Him. You know, I, I think about this at times. 
you know, we, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a kind of a guy, I like to get things done. I got a list, let's go. Monday, got to check, check, check it off. You know, I'm feeling good. Got my schedule going, and I understand, not everybody's like that, but I'm like that. And one day, you know, I was going over my list and realized the Lord's going to come before I'm finished my list. <laughs> I better be ready. You know, I'll be on number four of 12 or something and I'll be in the middle of number four and I haven't finished number four and He will come. When we least expect it, because in my, in, my, in my mind I'm thinking, well, he's, He'll wait till I'm kind of, you know, I got everything squared away and then He'll come. No, that's not how it's going to happen. He'll come in the middle. You'll be in the middle of a sentence. You'll be in the middle of an act, the middle of a thought, the middle of a word, the middle of a prayer, and He will appear. Peter says that we the saints will hasten the day when the Lord will come. Isn't that interesting? 2 Peter 3.12. Now you're probably wondering what all of this has to do with fasting that I'm rambling and I'm far off the subject, but I'm not. L let me try to put this together. Isaiah was rebuking the people for thinking that a largely ceremonial, fleshly thing like fasting could somehow have a tangible effect in moving God in creating some kind of spiritual catharsis. catharsis. In other words, if we fast, if we really give ourselves to this exercise, It'll move God to do something. Do something about our economic situation. Do something about our political situation. But nothing happened. In many ways, the same is true today. We need to realize that, you know, whether some people, you know, sometimes there's a big hoopla about clapping during worship. You know, we sing songs and some churches they clap along and other churches don't. And there's always a big hoopla, but I've seen churches argue about this. But you know what? Whether we clap in worship or not changes nothing in heaven. That one teacher or group is honored more than another in our brotherhood does not advance a whit the cause of Christ in the world that our nation is richer, that our nation is poor, that our nation is first, that our nation is last, influences nothing insofar as the kingdom of God is concerned. However, that we consciously pour ourselves out in achieving God's justice for those who are oppressed, that we spread God's love and caring for the needs of others, that we truly become salt and light wherever we are in the name of Christ, this will make a difference here in the world because God's light will shine in dark places because of us. Here in our hearts because we will grow in power and others will see it, be strengthened by it and be moved by it. And it will also make a difference here in the kingdom, the church, because it will bring us closer to that day when the kingdom of heaven in heaven will become one with the kingdom of heaven here on earth at the return of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. We need to realize that the Bible doesn't tell us to simply wait stoically for Jesus' return, like you're waiting for a bus or something. It says to pray for it, to work for it, to remain faithful, to do all that we can do to hurry the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so every generation brings us closer uh, to this point. But some people speed it up a little faster than others. Let's let our generation be a golden era where we make great strides in moving the heavens towards the coming of that day. We are only held back from spiritual greatness by the things that we have tied ourselves down to here on earth. Let's break free of that. You know, I, this sermon, not necessarily a quote New Year's sermon, you could preach this at any time, but at this particular, on this particular night, I think it's apropos to say, let's break free and allow God to make of us a spiritual wonder, a Christian phenomenon. Why not? Why shouldn't we aim for that? Let's cross the divided sea of doubt and fear Let's walk on the water of materialism without sinking. 
Let's do the greater things that Jesus spoke of. Justice, love, peace. Let's let that be. You know, um, Marty, this morning, you know, he was talking about uh, our mind was dwelling on those things which are lovely, those things which are pure and good that Paul is talking about. That's, that's, that's not just like a, a pie in the sky thing. That's a very practical thing. Is our minds always about how am I going to get ahead? Uh, uh, when am I going to finish the to-do list? Uh, <laughs> how can I make more money? Is that what our mind, is that where our heart is? Is that where our intention is all the time? Both Paul and Isaiah are saying no. Our mind should be focused on justice and love and peace if we're Christians. That's what seeking the kingdom is. If, 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 if I were to exhort you to, to pursue one thing in, in the new year, to make one resolution, it would be please pursue the kingdom first. And then God will add all these other things and what we need. It's such a simple promise, but we, we forget it all the time because it seems so impossible, but no. Our task is to seek the kingdom of God in everything we do each day. And he says, if you put your mind to that, I'll make sure that everything you need, I'll provide it for you. But unfortunately, what we do is we put all our heart and soul and energy in providing the things we need. And then once a week, we give God an hour of our time. And then we wonder, why am I not growing? Why am I not getting this? Why don't I have more spiritual insight? Why am I not more powerful in overcoming this temptation? Or whatever. Well, how strong would you be if you only spent one hour a week in the gym? Or if you only followed your diet, one meal, one meal per week you followed your diet, how successful would you be? You know, if you're an athlete, you only train once a week. How, could you go to the Olympics on once a week? Why, why in heaven's name do we ever think that we can become great spiritually by investing an hour or two of time? God is calling us to give our whole heart. And so what does it mean to love God with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength? That means that attitude on a daily basis. And brothers and sisters, it's not a burden. It's, it's not a thing that's hard to do. It's liberating. It's liberating. You, you want to taste freedom. Give yourself all to God every day. Ask Him to show you how to free yourself, to devote all of your strength and, and mind to Him. Does that mean you know, you're going to go off to a cabin somewhere with your Bible? And no, we got to live, we got to earn our, a living. Everybody's got to do that. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of heart and spirit. And what a liberating attitude it is once we, once we get past the doubt that if we don't invest every moment of energy in this world, we won't make it. This is, this is Satan. This is the world that is convincing us of that. Jesus gives us the recipe for a happy, content, and successful life. Seek ye the kingdom first, he said. Make that first in everything, and I will provide everything else that you need. Brothers and sisters, we can do it, and we should do it. And as part of my invitation tonight, if someone needs to perhaps begin that process by putting the kingdom first, because they haven't obeyed the gospel. There may, some, may be some folks here tonight that haven't obeyed the gospel. Maybe someone needs the prayers. I mean, uh, I know I repeat it every time, but believe me, I mean it with all my heart when I say perhaps there's someone that needs the prayers of the church to be strengthened in the things that I've talked about tonight. We have some of our elders here. Uh, I know Marty's not well, but we have elders here that'll be able to pray for you and ministers that'll be able to take care of you. So if you have a need of some kind, then I encourage you to come forward and ask for prayers or confess Christ as we stand and as Johnny leads us in our song of encouragement.